Well, good morning or afternoon. It's actually uh, 1 p.m. and we finally arrived at the highlight of my trip, which is Volvicont Castle. It's magnificent. It's the first time I see it. I've never been, so I'm very, very happy. I just want to give you a little bit of a history. This is the residence that was built by Fouquet, who was Louis XIV Minister of Finances. Um, and he had a big party at some point and Louis XIV, the king of France, who was at the time living at Le Louvre, came over to visit and was shocked to see that his minister of finances was living in a better house than he did. So he hired the same um, garden guy, I think he's, that's Le Nôtre, and the same architect and he built Versailles. So this is the castle that inspired uh, the building of Versailles. And legend has it that Louis the King was so upset that Fouquet obviously had so much money, he was afraid that he was actually embezzling him. Uh, Fouquet disappeared. <laughs> well, story has it that he kind of like disappeared for a while and that inspired the Alexandre Dumas story, um, The Man in the Iron Mask, because there was indeed a man in the Iron Mask, and quite possibly it was Fouquet, <laughs> who was bounced from one uh, prison to the other wearing a mask so that nobody would recognize him. In the novel, if I recall properly, he's supposed to be a twin of the king, and they do like a, a switcheroo, but anyway, um, I'm going to turn the camera around and I hope you enjoy this. We are visiting the castle and the gardens. I'm right at the entrance and here's Volvicont. Let's zoom in. So this is the front entrance but the prettiest part of the castle is actually at the back. Uh, where all the gardens, the fountains, and all of that is. So here's the castle. It's a huge property. Uh, altogether, I believe it's 500 acres. Uh, so you would come in through here with your coaches. You know, they would stop there in front of the uh, castle. Ladies would come down. Uh, Mom is all the way over there. And I got the tickets already. So again, you come in and we're gonna see the first floor uh, which is the private apartments of Fouquet. We're going to see um, the living rooms and all of that. And I believe that we are going downstairs and we're also going to see the kitchen. Yeah, so they would come in here and you know this is a um, carriageway because of the big stones here on the corner. That would be to stop and redirect the carriage towards the center. Um, and we start the castle visit with the carriage house. And the castle is all the way over there. Ils sont en bonne santé, hein, les... Yeah, et puis ils sont vieux. Ah, ils sont bien dans le côté, oui. Ouais. Je te demande quel très, très bien dans le côté. did some research on the roses. And they are Jardin de Grandville Blanc à Coeur Rose Pâle. So they are white roses with pink hearts.
Hi guys, um, it's Volvicont. Okay, so I am going to take my time on this one because I have a lot of history <laughs> to share with you and it's important stuff. Um, if you like history, you're in for a treat because there's a lot going on with Volvicont and um, the history of the castle itself and how it was built, but in particular, <laughs> the shockwave that happened as a result of the um, whole concept of Volvicont. So I'm going to separate that into different uh, parts. So you'll see videos and then I'll jump in like I am right now and then there'll be more videos and then I'll jump right back in. So you just saw the outside and I'm going to give you the history of um, Nicolas Fouquet, who's the initial owner of the castle. So we are in the year 16 something, 17th century France, Louis XIV is king. Anne of Austria is his wife. And I don't know if you've realized, but there was no separation between um, the state and the church back in those days. So each king had a tutor and that tutor would end up being the prime minister. And that prime minister was always a cardinal. And it was Richelieu under Louis XIII and then it became uh, Mazarin under Louis XIV. And they were always very influential figures. So if you were in the favors of the cardinal, you more than likely had an edge over a whole bunch of people with regards to obtaining specific position and obtaining riches, titles, things like that. And that was the case with Nicolas Fouquet. So Nicolas Fouquet was the superintendent of finances under Louis XIV. He wasn't the minister of finances, like I said at the beginning of the video. He was the superintendent. He was number two with regards to finances. And he was superintendent, hold on, let me look at this because I want the right date, 53 to 61. So 1653 to 1661. So who is Nicolas Fouquet? He was um, born to a family of merchants. He was not noble. He was born to a family of merchants, but the father was very ambitious and figure out a way to make a good impression on Cardinal de Richelieu at the time of Louis XIII. And as a result, he was able to position himself um, with a lot of overseas deals. That was the time where France started to colonize the Caribbeans. And he was in the shipping industry and other things. So he made a ton of money <laughs> doing that uh, as a protege of Richelieu. So of course, when he has uh, his child, uh, Nicolas, and a whole bunch of other kids, they are all falling under the good grace and favor of Cardinal de Richelieu. It just so happens that he is also the father, extremely devout, and the whole family is very, very devout. Matter of fact, I think they had something like eight kids, and only two of them did not join the clergy, and that would be Nicholas and his brother. So, but they were still very, very pious and you will see when we go to the inside of the castle that Nicholas um, bedroom had a lot of religious things like a lot of big crucifix and and religious icons things like this so the whole um, the whole family is very much involved in the church which at the time was really helping you in getting a position in society so he goes to law school and he happens to be good with numbers. <laughs> so Richelieu puts him in, um, as part of his first jobs, puts him in a position where he's kind of overseeing the expenditure of money for specific wars. Now, Louis XIV was about to be king and his father was a warmonger and Louis XIV was way worse. He literally ruined the country with his wars. It was war upon war upon war. And in order to finance those wars, there had to be taxations and a whole bunch of stuff. So this is like the preemptive to where we're going 
when it comes to the French Revolution. Like people had enough. Okay, this is three generations now that we're going from war to war to war. So he puts him in charge of overseeing a particular conflict and to see whether or not there was money that was being embezzled, taken out of the uh, um, coffers of the state and misappropriated. And he did very well with that. And then Richelieu dies, Mazarin becomes cardinal, and because of his relationship with Richelieu and because of his talents already as a human being, and he's actually presenting very good Fouquet. He's a gentleman, he's, uh, um, he's poised. Bottom line is that Fouquet is a charismatic individual and he's starting to become very influential. So after he did that little job for Richelieu uh, with very good result, he's being placed as superintendent of finances. And his job was to oversee uh, the financing of France, which at the time was an absolute disaster. <laughs> they were in the red every year, year after year, because of the ongoing wars that Louis XIV was spending money on. And in a very short period of time, after reviewing um, the ledgers and where the money was going and who was spending what on, on where, he manages to not only balance the budget, but he also brings a surplus to the budget of uh, the crown. And everybody was kind of shocked, actually. He didn't point fingers at to who, as to who was taking money, who was being paid double, where the waste was. He just started moving things around and he was able to not only finance the wars, but provide the king with a surplus. So he got the favor of Louis XIV. At the time, it was a big deal. And he also got the favor of Anne d'Autriche, his wife. And we'll talk about her at a later time. So Fouquet gets married and he gets married to a woman who is um, extremely rich herself and is given a massive dowry. At the time, it was 160 something thousand pounds. Um, I don't know what it is today, but it's something close to like, let's say $16 million, okay? So she's very rich and he's also very rich. So what does he do? He buys titles. He actually buys a title and with the title comes an estate and that is Vaux le Vicomte. So he buys the property in 1641 and he decides that he's going to spend the next 20 years expanding the castle, expanding the grounds and he hires people at the time who were known for being the best of the best. He has Lebrun to do the paintings and um, the ceilings, all of the ornaments on the walls. He has Le Nôtre to do the um, gardens. And these are the same guy, by the way, who worked on Versailles. But I'll tell you about that in a second. So he builds this castle. And because he's very charismatic and influential, he starts to attract a lot of people. And among those people are famous people. The equivalent of your Academy Awards folks today would be going to Volvicont as guests. And some of them were actually taking residence there. Molière, the playwright, was pretty much living at the Volvicont. So was La Fontaine and Corneille. All of those big French literature uh, and poets were permanent fixtures at Volvicont. The problem is that they started to stay there and no longer attend the court of Louis XIV. So rumors started and people put a bug in Louis XIV's ear that his, his superintendent of finance is having a whole operation over there uh, west of Paris that seems to attract a lot of people and um, perhaps it is time uh, that we look into it. And the one person in particular who wanted to look into it was the actual Minister of Finances, and that was Colbert. And Colbert was extremely paranoid and very much jealous of Fouquet. Couldn't stand him. 
I guess he didn't like the fact that it was charismatic and was attracting all of those people um, who were surrounding him at all times. So Colbert saw an opportunity to do something about it. Fouquet learning that the king was questioning what was going on there, decides around the time that the castle was pretty much complete to invite the entire court and the king to Volvicomte to showcase what he had done. Now, mind you, as I mentioned earlier, the king at the time was living either at Le Louvre or was living at the uh, Chateau de Fontainebleau. And those were nice residences but they didn't have the grandeur of the gardens like Volvicomte has and the space and all of the other accommodations. So he has his big party and he invites the king. Colbert didn't show up. The king, however, does show up. And from the very point that he passed the gate, the king is not happy at all. <laughs> so he goes into the salons, he looks around, he's being served dinner on gold and silver plates, crystals, valets everywhere, music, artwork, tapestries, everything gilded, le bruns, um, ceilings, the gardens by le nôtre, it is extremely extravagant and the king is displeased. He retires early, goes to his wing because Fouquet had an entire wing built just for the king. And this is where it goes sour. It's one thing to have the king as a guest. Um, you make the best of it in terms of accommodations. Um, the king usually brings his entire court with him so it's hard to house them. Fouquet had it all. He had the space to house the entire court. All of the building that you saw around it were accommodating valets, maids, counts, duchesses, and their ladies-in-waiting. All of it could be housed at Volvigant. And he had apartments entirely created for the king. So the king is by himself in his bedroom, which you're going to see in a minute. Um, and summons Fouquet and tells him, I'm particularly troubled by what I'm saying. And Fouquet, <laughs> for some reason, thought that the king was displeased because it wasn't good enough. He didn't put it together that he was surpassing the king of France. And the king tells him, you live better than I do. I have a problem with that. And here comes the biggest mistake of Fouquet's life. He looks straight in the eye of the king. And remember, he's very pious, okay? He's a man of faith. He's a good man, generally speaking. Not, nobody never had anything bad to say about Fouquet. He looks at him and says, but <laughs> your highness, if it pleases you so, I give it to you. It is my gift to you. Now imagine you have a better residence than the king, and on top of that, you willingly give it away. He didn't like that at all. He leaves the following day, goes straight to Colbert, and tells him, I don't like it, something's up. Colbert takes this as the opportunity of his life to get back at Fouquet, and before you know it, accusations of embezzlement and stealing from the coffers of the king are being thrown out there, and Louis XIV has Fouquet arrested. And he was arrested in 1661, I believe. That was the year it was finished, because he started in 1641, finished in 1661. Guess who is being charged in arresting Fouquet? None other but a lieutenant of the Mousquetier at the time named D'Artagnan. So now you're going to start seeing the whole connection with the Three Musketeers and Alexandre Dumas. So D'Artagnan is being charged with arresting Fouquet. Fouquet was absolutely besides himself, doesn't understand <laughs> why am I being arrested. Um, but Louis de Fortune has a big problem. Remember, Fouquet is very influential and has a lot of friends. 
and one of his best friends is Aramis, one of the musketeers. And Aramis is actually the musketeer I have downstairs, the one, uh, the bronze statue, is one of the four musketeers. Um, another friend of Fouquet is Anne of Austria, the queen herself. She was very close to Mazarin. Mazarin was extremely close to Fouquet. But once Mazarin died, his influence vanished overnight. And that's when everything started to unravel for Fouquet. One of the things that he did that he should not be proud of is that Fouquet tried to pay one of Louis XIV's mistresses to be a spy. Uh, and that's proven. He did that. He did pay the, uh, uh, tried to pay the woman uh, who was one of the king's mistresses uh, to be a spy. And there's a possibility that that was done on behalf of Anne of Austria um, because they were, remember, friends. Now, what kind of friends they were, I'm not going to get into that um, because that's neither here nor there. So what is Louis XIV doing with Fouquet now? He has a trial with 22 judges and he really thought, and so did Colbert, thought that he was going to be um, found guilty of embezzlement and they were going to be able to just put him at the gallows and have him killed, death sentence. Well, except that only nine of the judges agreed to a death sentence and the other 13th said uh, banishment. But banishment looks bad <laughs> for the king, considering the influence that Fouquet had and all of his friends, because uh, he had a lot. It wasn't just the writers and the you know uh, poets and all of that. He had a lot of friends. So he couldn't really banish him, meaning put him on the boat and send him to exile on one of the islands. He couldn't really do that. So he decided to give him life in prison. So it's now like 1665. Um, the verdict is read and... It is life imprisonment. Fouquet is taken away from Volvicomte and sent to various prisons and kept under deplorable conditions. His wife was only able to visit once the entire time that he was in prison and he stayed in prison until the day he died and he died in 1680. So he was in prison for a good um, 17 years. So what does it have to do with the man in the iron mask? Well, there's different um, stories about it. So the Alexander Dumas story, the man in the iron mask, is actually, uh, it's fiction. The man in the iron mask is the king's twin brother, who was the better of the twins. And Louis XIV was just crazy spending too much money, ruining France um, financially, and they wanted to do a switcheroo. So that's the story. And of course, the musketeers are involved because Anne of Austria is involved, D'Artagnan is involved, Aramis is involved. Um, possibly she was a lover of either of them. We don't know for sure. But that's the story under Alexandre Dumas. There's also people who believe that the man in the iron mask was actually Fouquet's valet. The valet was allowed to go uh, and visit Fouquet to bring him supplies. He wrote his memoir, he did a lot of things. Um, even though he was kept under deplorable condition, he still had access to a valet. But the king didn't want people to know where Fouquet was in prison. We found that out much later on. Um, once manuscripts, manuscripts were uncovered. Um, technically, during the time that Fouquet was in prison, we know, we, nobody knew which prison he was in. So the valet would be recognized um, in order for people not to put one and two together. Let's put an iron mask on the valet and that way nobody knows who he is and who he's visiting. The other theory, the one I believe in, is that Fouquet was the man in the iron mask. And he put him in an iron mask because he moved him. Louis XIV moved him from one prison to the other because it was really bad. <laughs> it was a bad move to have Fouquet imprisoned for life, especially considering that 
Louis XIV dilapidated and scattered all of his belongings. Everything was taken out. The furniture, the art, all of it was taken out. Some of it was reacquired later on, but during the reign of Louis XIV, in order for him to finance more wars, he literally had um, tapestries that had gold in it. He had the gold removed and melted to finance a cannon. Silver candelabras were melted to do bullets or um, handle on guns. Louis XIV told people to literally pillage Volvicont and help themselves. So, and everybody knew that. It was a bad move and he knew it. So he had him positioned in different prisons in South of France, in North of France, all over the place. And in order for people to not know who was being moved, who was this prisoner with so many guards around him, um, they put an iron mask on him. And that was Fouquet. And that's what I believe. So that's the story of Fouquet and Volvicomte. Now, Volvicomte was by far at the time the most advanced castle. Um, it didn't have running water or anything like this. It wasn't that time yet. But in terms of the lighting, in terms of the height of the ceilings, in terms of the way it was built, um, the way the apartments were separated from each other, the way it was just conceived altogether was so grand, so innovative that Louis had those three guys. I forgot the name of the architect. Uh, I'll put the name right here. And hired them to build him a castle. And that is how Versailles was born. Versailles is not a copy of Volvicomte when it comes to the outside. It is a totally different um, architecture. But the inside of Versailles is very, very similar to Volvicomte. So if you were to pick, do I want to go to Versailles or do I want to go to Volvicomte when I'm visiting France? Pick Volvicomte because I think you'll enjoy it more and you'll, you'll see when we visit that there's really barely anybody visiting there. Versailles on the other end, you're going to wait four hours in line, it's going to be crowded, you're going to have your camera like this to try to see stuff. It's really not a comfortable visit um, to go see Versailles and I think Volvicomte is way more charming. So let's go look at the inside of Volvicomte. And when I come back, I'll tell you everything you need to know about the De Vaugue family and who is now the principal owner of the castle.
Was that fabulous or what? <laughs> I'm telling you, Versailles is exactly the same way, so you're better off just go to Volvicont. Um, it's, it's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. So now you've seen um, his private apartments, uh, and you've seen his bedroom, and you've seen the little rooms and the little apartments that were kept by his protégés, and that would be Molière, Corneille, La Fontaine, all of these guys, they would just, you know, squat, basically, and write their masterpieces out of those little écritoires, <laughs> desks that you saw, um, and the king's apartments. Okay, you saw that. Um, no wonder the king didn't like it one bit. <laughs> No wonder. So, before we go to the gardens and the kitchen, because the kitchen is really fabulous, I want to tell you about the de Vaugre family. In 1878, some guy named Saumier um, had the opportunity to purchase Volvicont. And Volvicont at the time was dilapidated. It was really, really in a bad shape. Had holes in the, in the uh, roof, um, broken tiles everywhere, you know, crown molding falling, paint peeling, you name it. And there was barely anything left in it because again, Louis XIV pretty much emptied it out to finance his wars. So he buys it and he makes it his life mission to rehab it. Um, and of course he had money. So I think he was a banker. Um, he had money, so he was able to do it. And then his three grandsons took over. And one of them, um, his mom married a guy named de Vaugué. These are all nobles. They had money too. So the three grandsons decides to take it over. And here comes a whole legacy now of three kids, three boys, who are making it their life mission to restore the castle to its original state the way Fouquet intended it to be. Now they have more kids. Now the great-grandsons, still the Vaugué family and still the Vaugué names, are still doing that. And um, I think it's Patrick de Vaugué, I'm not sure, um, decides in 1968 to make it public. And they live, in, they live in the castle, by the way. These are the apartments that are above that you don't see. They actually live there daily. That's their house. And maybe when I showed you the castle and the inside, you were able to see at some point, you see like family pictures. Yeah, because they live there. <laughs> That's, that's their home, okay? Can you imagine? Can't, I can't, just the heating bill alone. But anyway, um, they live there and they want to be able to finance the restorations. And the only way to do it, because it's 68 and financially France not doing too well, is to make it public. So now you open it as a museum, and you open it as a, what is it, a 4, 3B or whatever. So you can have a charity and you can have an endowment and uh, all, all of those things. So money starts to pour in. People are actually friends of Volvicont. It's an actual association. You can donate to them. I'll put the name down below. Um, are doing that. They get fundraisers and the fundraisers go directly into the restoration of the castle. We're now in the fifth generation of three um, Comte de Vaugué, and they are just as passionate as their great great grandfather was, Mr. Saumier. Um, they are dedicating their entire life um, to restoring the castle. And I cannot, I can only imagine if you want to marry any of these guys or their children. I wonder if you have to sign a contract that yes, you will dedicate your entire life to the restoration of all Vicomte. Because I'll do it. I sign up for that. I mean, not now, obviously. But in my 20s, I would have done that. Um, it's fascinating, really. And as a tidbit, when we went there, there was barely anybody. And at the cash register, one of the great-great-grandson, um, one of the great-great-grandson, was actually manning the cash register. <laughs> With his barber uh, jacket, you know, very um, country gentleman. <laughs> Um, he, he was there, so we had a conversation with him and we talked to him. Um, I was particularly interested in the garden 
and the vegetable garden and whether or not they were going to do the vegetable garden and he said that this is one of the main goal for the next two years is to rehab the entire vegetable garden the way it used to be in the Fouquet where there was enough food year long to feed the entire castle that's the residents and the staff and they make honey I bought some honey from them um, but the garden is really the primary uh, focus right now is to rehab the vegetable garden so let's look at the kitchen and the garden and I will leave it at that I hope you've enjoyed this video it is I hereby declare Volvicomte the prettiest most magical castle in all of France I've seen a lot I've seen all of the castles in the Loire Valley I've seen all the ones near Germany all the ones in Nova France, all the ones outside of Paris. Um, I think it's the prettiest and the most magical and it was pure delight, absolute pure delight to get to see it. Um, it's extraordinary and I have to commend the de Vaugure family for the work that they've been doing on it. I mean it is restored to perfection they are meticulous there wasn't anything out of place the staff is extremely friendly and welcoming the place itself is just the atmosphere it has an atmosphere see Versailles doesn't have that Volvicon has an atmosphere and when you visit it's included in the ticket you get an audio tour and the audio tour actually reads as a play. So it's conversations between Fouquet and his wife, Fouquet and Molière, Fouquet and the king and the actors and they, they actually, it's like listening to a play. Um, and it really gives you a deep understanding of what, what's going on. Um, go, that's all I have to say. If you go to France, if you go to Paris, take a day, take the train, take the bus, rent a car, Uber it, don't care. Go. Go to Volvicomte. It's phenomenal. Absolutely love it and I can't wait to go back. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. At the end, I have a gallery of the pictures as I always do and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye! Je dis ça doit être les escaliers de service. Huh? This is kind of service. That's for the servants. No, but they are not going to the escalier of service. We're going to the kitchen. I can't wait. I believe, at least it's my opinion, that Volvicomte is better looking than Versailles. <laughs> So the food couldn't possibly be hot by the time it got upstairs. So the castle, this castle is one of the first one in France to actually have a dining room. And around the time of Louis XIV is when Give me a moment, <laughs> is when uh, French cuisine really became a thing. They uh, started experimenting and adding spices, flavors, all the sauces came about. The wine cellar. It's really cold. Really, really cold. C'est super. Jim Mom is like, wow. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> magnifique, son plan. <laughs> so we saw a whole bunch of gilded stuff, and Mom goes to the cellar. And she's like, oh, it's yeah. glorious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the stalactites, <laughs> stalactites <laughs> coming down, yeah. Yeah, he had to be freezing. He devait se geler, he devait se geler. Alors, ils ont pas encore, tu vois, la différence. 
Ceux-là, ils sont oh, pas... j'ai de l'eau qui m'est tombée dessus. Ils ouais. sont pas encore per... Oui, moi aussi. Ils sont pas encore percés, tu vois. Donc, uh -huh. tu peux pas tirer le vin. Uh -huh. Par contre, là, ici, tu les as... ils sont percés en bas, tu vois. Uh -huh. So in the cellar, and it's really cold, so that's why they keep all the fruits. And uh, yeah, mom notices that the, uh, the fruits don't touch each other. And it's the same thing on the other side. So that's how they kept fruits fresh. And the, all the herbs and little pots. Wow. Okay, the kitchen proper, here we go. Oi. Oi. <laughs> Là, ils font la lessive, ils sèchent les, euh, ils sèchent les sabots avec de la paille à l'intérieur. Et lui, il est en train de, de se boucher. Il plume et... Oh, dis donc. Now we're looking at the uh, Museum of Cultures, various ages. After all these years, I finally found out how they transported Louis XIV's orange trees from the outside to the inside of the castle. Apparently, they had a special wagon to do it. That's neat.
right? We're on our way to the gardens. Mom's gonna give her, give us her opinion of her visits. C'est un, un endroit exceptionnel de par euh, l'histoire qu'il ra, qu raconte et la tenue de, cette, de ce monument qui est absolument impeccable. C'est propre, c'est bien, c'est bien entretenu. C'est superbe, quoi. Je recommande cette visite à tout le monde, à tout, tous ceux qui viendront en France. Difficile à trouver parce que c'est un peu loin de Paris, mais c'est absolument fantastique. Et c'est tenu par une famille qui vraiment a, a à cœur de garder ce, cette immense propriété euh, et de la restaurer dans l'état euh, du XVIIe siècle. C'est vraiment superbe. Uh, I, I think that's a, a, a yes. Is it true? And we didn't see the gardens yet. So what we're going to do, because we're a little tired, is take the, uh, a, a golf cart and you get them right after the castle. And we're going to just go through the gardens, get off the cart, take pictures, visit, and that would be it.